Hey everybody, Patrick Connor here and welcome to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. Here to do more boxing history plus true crime. That means I'm here with my dude Eris Pina, compu box operator and also fellow fight historian Eris. What's up, man? What's going on, my dude? Another episode, another deep dive into a subject that doesn't get discussed nearly enough, and I'm excited as hell about it. Let's go. You know, uh, it, it checks a couple boxes for both of us, but you especially, heavyweights, crazy oh, yeah. heavyweights, you know, <laughs> off the rails well, heavyweights. Yeah, exactly, man. You know, we've, I'm always... I've mean, always been interested in people that have that crazy dark energy because they're fascinating individuals in some ways. But I figured since we just got over Wilder Fury, you know, the um, everyone's still talking about it this week. Now today's discussion was on is Wilder a sore sport because he wouldn't respect Fury after the fight, even though he was basically concussed, had no idea what was going on, still in the heat of the moment. Like, you know, Wilder's a big poor sport over that. Anyways, lots of drama, big punchers. Figured, why not stay on that route and talk about heavyweights again, right? With that being said, the past 40, 50 years, when you discuss the biggest heavyweight punchers that's been out, that's, that's been out there for the past 40 years, people bring up George Foreman, Ernie Shavers, Mike Tyson, um, David Tua, you know, the list goes on and on. Wilder. Maybe like a Jerry Cooney. Yes, Cooney, absolutely. Joe Frazier, um, you know, there's all kinds of people that have mentioned that absolute monstrous punches, Lennox Lewis um, for the heavyweights, right? So what about certain names that don't get mentioned ever? Well, one name and the one that we're going to discuss today is Jeff Sims. Jeff Sims ranks probably up there with the hardest of the, heavy, of the heavyweight division when it comes to one punch knockout power. The man had absolutely scary, scary power. The type that left dudes, when they got hit by him really solidly, they would just fall like they were shot. Limp, no energy, nothing, just collapse. But this was also a guy that had a ton of demons, so he was never able to realize his full potential. And that's what we're going to begin into today. The crazy life and times and crimes of Jeff Sims. 80s contender, absolute maniac outside the ring. It was a damn good intro. It's a damn good intro. Fine intro. Yeah. I, I think you, you summed it up very nicely. It's a, a very interesting time coming off of kind of like the reign of Muhammad Ali and in the, the heavyweights when he had recaptured the title and kind of just went on his glorification <laughs> tours and stuff like that and was living off of his name for a while and I had mentioned in previous episodes where he had fought some opponents that aren't super familiar and stuff like that and then when he had wound up losing the title there was a big vacuum of power and <clears throat> excuse me right around that time like this is right when Jeff Sims comes around and he's one of like you said kind of like a legendary almost like a mythical puncher in the sense that, like, he didn't really accomplish all that much as a professional or as an amateur, really. But he was able to do a handful of things, and I guess also his reputation outside of the ring that led to him being quite remembered, for sure. He fits right in with that crazy motley crew of the 80s, you know, especially the lost generation of heavyweights that... If you really want to put it, I guess it would start around when Leon Spinks became champion in 1978. Um, the whole generation that we're about that we're getting into didn't come until like a couple in the very beginning of the 1980s. But Spinks was the start of it because, as we know, he was stripped of the title for refusing to defend against Ken Norton because he had the audacity to give Muhammad Ali a rematch. And once the title got splintered, that's when things became haywire. You know. John Tate became WBA champion, as you can see over here, and losing it to Mike Weaver. That goes on its own saga. Larry Holmes is champion, you know. But with Muhammad Ali leaving, as you just said, Pat, there was, like, a void to be filled. Larry Holmes was the dominant champion and recognized as much, but he obviously didn't have, you know, the quality that Ali was, and he wasn't adored by the public that way. Tate had the potential to become the man of the 80s and was looking for it until he fought Mike Weaver and his life unraveled after that and his career never recovered. And a, a bunch of heavyweights came into the picture from there. 
that eventually Don King kind of put under an umbrella and wrapped them up in a ball. And that was where guys like Greg Page, Tony Tubbs, Tim Witherspoon, um, Michael Dokes, you know, a lot of these fighters that came through this era would end up trading the title over and over at patty cakes and all that. The one other heavyweight that was from that era, again, was Jeff Sims. He didn't last as long as the others from there because of various reasons we're going to get into. But right in the beginning of the 1980s, he was right in the mix as well as any of them and just known as a reputation, not so much for his boxing skills, but just how scary his power could be. And the few films, the fight films that, you know, survived from that time show as much. You know, they, they talk about like on in memes and on social media and stuff about Florida, man. Like Jeff Sims was definitely a Florida man for sure. <laughs> oh, dude, uh, to the core, not like Miami Beach, Florida or anything. We are talking Southern, you know, country down in the South, like poverty, Florida, really bad. Well, there were, and I, I think that that's, that actually figures into this, his story and his background quite a bit. And as we know, on these previous true crime episodes, I like to kind of weave that into the, into the story a bit so that we can understand the background of these, these human beings, these characters that we're talking about. Jeff Sims, according to him, he said his father left his mom while she was still pregnant with him. So he never really knew his father and his mother died when he was either 16 or 17 and she was 46 and he said she died of a heart attack and he said that he thought that it was possible she had died from overworking herself in the sugarcane fields and also raising 10 children. He was one of 10 children and so he wound up working in the same uh, sugarcane fields and as just about anybody knows that's manual labor, any sort of produce picking, uh, cutting, anything like that, where you're working in sludgy fields is not easy. It's um, very physically taxing. And so his mom had done that for a long time, apparently. And that's what he started doing when he was a young kid. And then he also learned how to work on a farm. Uh, but the kind of social implications behind the sugarcane fields, like there's a lot of racial implications behind those as well anywhere around the Caribbean, where in this part of Florida, um, you know, it, it's Florida is known for being close to Cuba. Cuba is also known for its sugar cane. And historically, the people who work sugar cane fields were either slaves or dark skinned people, people who were of low income, because people who were of low income couldn't really, uh, you know, afford better jobs. And so that's the whole point of this is that it's uh, Jeff Sims background comes from a, a, a pretty rough background and a background of rough manual labor. And he referred to the problems that he wound up having later on in life as his quote unquote losses in the streets. And so he, he also was somewhat traveled because he used to go from Florida to Pennsylvania when he was younger, according to what season it was and what work he can get uh, picking produce. So he had a tough life. He did not grow up in any way charmed. Not at all. Um, like you said, man, he grew up in the height of poverty right there. He had no parents. He had to defend for himself. And he also, also mentioned many times that he basically had to rate like, he was the head that he was had to take care of his brothers and sisters. He was like, I had 10, you know, 10 brothers and sisters. It was just us on our own. I had to do what I had to do. And like you said, he went to the fields, he was picking tomatoes, he was picking other produce and things like that, 10 cents a crate, and just making a living at that. The hardest, that's really, really, really tough way to get by. And obviously you get really hard and tough because of that. And Sims just kind of fell into the wrong crowd and fell into trouble early on. I mean, around the age of 14 or 15 years old, he was, that's when he got shot for the first time. And which is crazy to think about. Imagine, I mean, it, it happens, obviously. I, I've grown up in an area where it's unfortunate. Back in the day, it wasn't uncommon for that to happen either. But um, I will say that, like, you know, for Sims, he was already starting out rough. Like, he had everything put against him. And one of those situations where you would think that, he's not going to make anywhere in life and he's going to be lucky to survive to the age of 18 at this point. 
but things were rough ahead of him. But, you know, soon after he was shot, still living, the next thing that came up was that he went to jail for manslaughter. You know, uh, one of the kind of recurring themes, and we talked about this on a couple of other of these episodes, is that it's like you not you don't really know what to believe. Mm-hmm. Because the, this particular character, like one of the main characters, is not super believable. In in this case, Jeff Sims himself, like a lot of this information about his youth is coming from him, um, because it's not it's not like it was widely covered. A lot of it happened around Palm Beach in Florida. Um, he was from the, an area called Bell Glade, and it, there weren't. There were papers, there were newspapers, obviously I found a lot of them, but there weren't massive papers, so it wasn't national coverage for a lot of this stuff. Uh, It was local coverage. So in any case, um, a lot of the details of this are coming from him. So it's really tough to say because as I'll get to, some of this stuff was, like he he told conflicting stories. So for instance... Whoa, like our buddy Trevor Burbick. (laughs) yeah, Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we, we uh, like many people, were on this theme of you brought up Deontay Wilder and the, the crazy things he was saying and the excuses he was making. And by the way, I will say that today he did congratulate Tyson Fury in a social media post. And he said that he was disappointed in the loss, but that he, you know, was thankful for the opportunity and appreciated Tyson Fury. So everybody can settle down. But <laughs> in any case... Similarly to to Trevor Bur- Trevor Burbick, yeah, there were things that Jeff Sim said that just didn't make a whole heap of sense. Like for instance, <clears throat> it sounded like he was younger when he told the story about whatever it was being shot. He said later on that when he was sixteen, he was walking down Fifth Street in Bell Glade, Florida, and caught a bullet to the head. He said the only reason why he lived is because a quote unquote black gangster hat deflected the bullet and it somehow only left him with like a scar. Um, and then, like you brought up, at either 17 or 18, newspapers said 18. He later said 17. I don't know. Sims was convicted of manslaughter for the shooting death of a man named Bobby Lee Cox, who was found dead in his apartment. And so Sims obviously knew his way around, like I said, because he fled and was apprehended in Buffalo, New York, which is not too far from the border of Canada and Pennsylvania. And according to the police report, um, and it's also important to note that a lot of this information also comes from police reports because just being candid, being straightforward, many of these newspapers take police reports as gospel and don't question any of the information in the police reports. So it's possible that some of the information from them was not correct. So anyway, just saying. Uh, but in any case, uh, Sim said that he had given the victim, Bobby Lee Cox, $170 to hold for him. And when he went to get it back, he said Cox called him dumb for giving him the money. And they wound up getting the fighting. And Sims later said he took bullets in the back at 16. And on another occasion, he suggests that he was shot by Bobby Lee Cox before he shot and killed him. But that wasn't mentioned in the police report at all. So, again, the crazy thing is that he supposedly had bullet wounds, like scars, like and all over him and several bullet fragments when he later was x-rayed. So he clear, something clearly happened, and he was stabbed as well in a totally different incident. He was stabbed. So he he had all of these scars. So it was like, I have absolutely no idea what was what was what because it was kind of difficult to to you know figure out what was real. And actually, to add yet another layer to that story, later on, much later on, he told a story that uh I'm actually I'm sorry, that other stuff was later on before he got famous. So he got famous, and I'm sure you'll say why in a couple minutes. Uh, and, and probably the reason why anybody would know Jeff Sims. You know, you might know him from the Ernie Shavers fight, but you'd know him for a different reason otherwise. But he said um, before he got famous that he was driving a getaway car during a petty crime, hit a pedestrian, 
and killed them. And that's what got him sent to prison. And so again, that seems kind of unlikely since like there's actual police reports of Bobby Lee Cox being found dead in his apartment. And then Jeff Sims being apprehended in Buffalo for the crime and then being prosecuted for it and sent to, I mean, like, you know, uh, not again, not wide coverage, but it's pretty clear that that was what happened based on the newspaper accounts from the court. So it, it's just kind of weird that he would say anything different, you know? And listen to this one too, because we were like, we, we were discussing this earlier. I found this New York times article and according to this one, I'll quote it right here. It goes, um, a, a guy I knew, this is Jeff Sims, a guy I knew accused me of stealing his jacket from the pool hall, said Sims. I didn't do it. But one night he waited for me in an alley and shot at me three times. No questions asked. I was living by myself in a little apartment then, and I worked in the field pulling corn and sharecropping. I had been surviving on the street since I was 12 years old. And when this argument happened, I didn't have nobody to help me because my mommy had died and my daddy left home when I was a baby and I got 10 brothers and sisters, but they was all struggling to make it for themselves. I asked the police for help, but they didn't do nothing. So I took it on myself. I got a point twenty two and shot the guy twice. The guy didn't live. He obviously was telling stories that he believed. I mean, I, I mean, it, telling, Wild, him in a, man, yeah. telling him in a way that suggested he believed him anyway, because nobody seemed to be challenging any of these stories they just they told them and they were like wow that's remarkable because that's they were they were it just I mean, it they're makes... very interesting ones yeah and and if you look at sims if there, there's not a ton of photos out there on him but if you see him if you ever catch the brief glimpses of an interview that you can hear him talk and all that you can realize he did have a rough life and he's a probably an extremely scary tough guy he looked at clear he was something was clearly off with him so, you know, when he tells you these stories, it's not like you can be like, oh, yeah, like some people, when they, when they spin a yarn around you, you can call bullshit on him right away. But a guy like Sims, it's kind of hard to do that because he looked like he actually did live that type of life. So it's like, you know, anything that he said so crazy and wild and out there like that, you probably went with it. And it's why, you know, considering all of that, out of everybody in that whole, you know, Motley crew of the Lost Generation, and there was a lot of characters that we were discussing. Sims is probably the craziest one out of all of them. And that says a hell of a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, and, and they and all have to live under that umbrella in Don King's compound in, 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 um, in Ohio, which I'm sure we'll discuss more as we talk about how the 80s progressed and things on. But, you know. Well, and especially because uh, just, yeah, I mean, I it, there's so many layers. If he really was making up stories, which I, it seems like he was, that makes it even more crazy, dude. <laughs> that makes it even crazier because he, like you said, he looked the part, he had the scars. And so uh, speaking of looking the part in prison, Sims starts doing some bodybuilding and he played a lot of football. He said that he got a name in prison for playing football in the yard. And I guess he was, he was a good athlete. And in any case, he said there in prison, there wasn't much to do apart from watch sports and play sports. And so another prisoner told him there wasn't any money in bodybuilding and that it was too late for him to get into football. And so he turned to a prisoner named duck apparently and learned how to box. Um, and again, he told, a slightly different variation of this story on another occasion that it was a totally different person. But in any case, it, I guess in this newspaper, it sounded good. And according to him, he fought more than 30 times as an amateur in the prison and uh, had a record of 33-0-1, oh, according to him. And I guess given the time, it's not really outside the realm of possibility because we talked about Charles Newell and we talked about how he was one of the first prisoners to fight out of that kind of like uh, prisoner fighting system up in the New England, um, mm -hmm. or I guess one of them. And so uh, I guess it's really not that outlandish to believe that he could have been an amateur. And, and it sounds like there's some corroboration about that. But because uh, I suppose at least in part because of the bodybuilding, he reminds me at least in terms of his build a lot of like Cleveland Williams 
where Cleveland Absolutely. Williams very muscle bound. Yeah. yeah. Not a muscle fat. But not just, but not muscle bound like like yoked, like yeah, like not, not Anthony out. Joshua or like ripped up or anything like that. Or Michael No, Grant not at all. Just like the, you know, the you kind, of, kind of Go ahead. Well well like the the kind of like yoked you get from doing hard work. Not the yep. kind of yoke you get from like just sitting lifting weights all the time or some shit like that, and not to, you know, try to drive a wedge between those things like I'm some sort of fitness expert or some shit. But regardless, he was almost like muscular. a clubber lane, man. like clubber lane. Yeah, just muscular and like fit and athletic. Mm -hmm. And so you could see, and uh, I'll try to post some photos because I in looking in the newspapers, there's far more photos than are, are available online. And some of the photos show he had just massive legs. Uh, he was very muscular. Individual, yeah, very. You could see that he was just a, a strong guy in general. And even despite not being a very big heavyweight. Absolutely. But that was the thing. He had that one punch knockout power. And so after he got out of jail, after, you know, doing the prison record like he did, he ended up in Miami Beach and ended up in the Fifth Street Gym run by Chris and Angelo Dundee, the legendary Fifth Street Gym. And um, from all, you know, according to Sims, he was brought in at first to be like kind of, uh, you know, a journeyman, a guy that's supposed to pad the records for everybody else. But everyone that they put him in, he started knocking them dudes out. And as that started happening, he was getting attention for that. And, you know, Chris Dundee liked him. And, you know, the, um, he started gaining a lot of traction in the local scene and soon enough became the Florida heavyweight champion. And it was around this time where Sims first got attention in the papers and everywhere else for um, an incident that happened with a comebacking Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> this actually goes down in history because if you notice a lot of those photos that come out with Ali wearing a mustache and everything like that in the early 80s, around 1980. It was because of this incident. So long story short, Ali was, you know, showed up to the gym one day to do what he always used to do at various gyms everywhere else, go spar with the local talent, run his mouth, cause a scene, get make some headlines, keep it pushing, right? So he came in that day, and Jeff Sims happened to be in the gym that day. And um, there's various stories of how it actually started. But Sims at one point said that he pulled the Ali act. And when Ali went in his dressing room or Ali went to the back, Sims ran to the back, started banging on it, pulling the Ali act. Get out here, sucker. I want to fight you. I want blah, 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 all that nonsense. Other stories say that Ali just came in there and said, I want you a baddest dude. And it was land. It happened to be Jeff Sims. So let's get in there. And, you know, they end up sparring. There's even more accounts that Ali was in his street clothes, not even in his regular, you know, um, trunks and gear before he sparred Sims. So there's all kinds of different accounts, but the main thing is they ended up getting in the ring together, moving around. And as they're moving, the Ali's obviously jaw jacking him, talking a lot of nonsense, everything like that. I'm not going to, um, I can't go word for word for what they said, but there's a detailed account of what Sims, you know, talked about it. Sims says they got into the ring. Sims basically said that he was trying to, you know, knock Ali's head off. He was like, you know, this is my opportunity. Ali's talking to me. You know, he's running his mouth. He's saying this to me, saying that. Then he calls me the N-word. He's like, I get really mad. And I said, I call him an Uncle Tom for Jimmy Carter. Then we start going back and forth, yelling at each other. And Sims makes an interesting comment. He goes, I can tell he's a pain freak. He was like, the more I hit him, the more he seems to like it. You know, so he was like, I'm hitting him as hard as I can. I'm hitting him in his ribs. I'm hitting him in the head, all this stuff. He goes, finally... As Ali starts talking again to make another comment, Sims hit him with a major right hand. It split Ali's lip all the way open. And Sims claims at that moment when I saw I busted him up, I stopped. He was like, I just backed up. So that's his account. Other accounts, the same thing, more similar accounts. They got in there. They were sparring. Ali was talking. Sims hit him while he was talking. And Ali busted his lip. Bottom line is Ali suffered a gnarly cut across his mouth, across his lip that made him get about 10 stitches, I think it was. And it was, the scar was so bad that he grew a mustache and started calling himself Dark Gable, um, <laughs> which is pretty hilarious, yeah. But that's how Ali had that mustache. And when you see those photos, that's where that's the incident from. I'm not sure what the fallout was from that, but I'm pretty sure people were pissed off that Sims would, you know, busted Ali's lip because that was not supposed to be in the script. 
Yeah, there's there's no question that uh, whatever was supposed to happen, his lip wasn't supposed to get slip. I'll, if I could rewind it and fill in just a few gaps, just because there's Please. there's actually a, a somewhat important character in there. Um, and so when Sims was released from prison, he, he wound up spending about five years of what he was supposed to spend was 15. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison for manslaughter. He was tried for murder, sentenced 15 for manslaughter, did five, and let out. And so that tends to suggest he was telling the truth about having learned a trade and educating himself in prison and being well-behaved, I suppose, because I don't think he would have you know, served only five years on a 15. Yeah, I, I, it just seems unlikely that he would have only served five on 15 if he were not well behaved. In in any case, um, so he says that he learned, he learned how to weld. He got like a welding certificate. But when he got out of prison, he couldn't land a job probably because he had been in prison would be my guess. So he went to a local Belglade business owner named J.L. Foster, and Foster sent him to go see Angelo Dundee and Chris Dundee at the Fifth Street Gym. And so uh, they told him that you'll need money for a hotel room and for equipment. So he goes back to J.L. Foster. J.L. Foster lends him several thousand dollars for equipment and for a hotel room to stay and to train. So that's kind of how that all started. And Chris Dundee, who was Angelo Dundee's brother, and then Chris Dundee's son, Mike Dundee, uh, all ran the Fifth Street Gym. And Mike Dundee wound up also picking up a handful of the contracts of some of the fighters as a manager, I believe. But in any case, Chris Dundee says that Jeff Sims reminds him straight away of Sonny Liston. And he said, I liked him from the beginning. And so he, along with another uh, local construction consultant named Lou Galliano, buy Sims' contract. And so uh, Galliano gave Sims a job driving a truck at his company. And that's kind of when it all started picking up for Sims. Like his pro career started uh, taking off and whatnot. And so when I'm looking at his record and based on what some of the newspapers are saying, I think they were counting one of his amateur wins as part of his pro record because of either that or a fight's missing. But in any case, he wound up going about 9-0 and and doing fairly well until, uh, you know, like you mentioned, winning the Florida State heavyweight title against a dude named Tom Prater. And by that point, he had become somewhat of kind of like a local legend, Sims, that is, for have for being a hard hitter. He was, you know, sending these dudes packing early. And uh, that's kind of, yeah, go ahead, jump in. I was going to say really quick, man, the thing, the fight with Prater was actually a feud that had gone on for a long time. And Prater himself was a name, probably most notably known for fighting Larry Holmes aboard that ship during that ridiculous Don King tournament that we did a <laughs> podcast on a long time ago, but... Regardless, I don't believe he fought again after that, after Sims knocked him out. And that was, you know, a culminating. That was the biggest win of his career up to that point. So, This was right during a time when the <laughs> Florida boxing scene was actually fairly hot. I mean, as hot as it could be. Um, there were very regular fights, especially in and around Miami Beach. And Tom Prater was one of the fighters around that scene. And Jeff Sims seemed to... You mentioned the the incident with Ali and kind of how he pulled an Ali or started doing all these tricks or whatever. And I think that he would, he was sometimes a talker like that, except for most people said he was a nice guy, you know, no, he was a good guy. He was a nice guy. And I mean, I think you could be a good guy and a nice guy and probably be, talk a little bit of shit when you get into the gym too. And it sounded like that was kind of what he did sometimes. And yeah, so he wound up actually winning the Florida state heavyweight title in that fight with Tom Prater, not all, like I said, when I go and do some social media stuff about this show, I'll try to post some photos because there's some really great photos. But um, he wound up pushing forward and he was fighting all around Miami Beach, Belle Glade, Orlando. And he, he, like I said, built a good following for himself. And going into this fight with a guy named Larry Alexander in Miami Beach, he actually said that there were... He said, quote unquote, girls waiting outside my dressing room trying to touch me and talk to me after the fight and or, you know, 
trying to make it so that they could, that I would stay in touch and talk to them after the fight, he said. And that there were people cheering him on from the stands and all sorts of stuff. And that his nephew had come to work his corner. And anyway, he winds up losing to Larry Alexander in kind of like what we'll see as a recurring theme with him as a heavyweight as he starts going uh, slightly higher in competition where he starts out steaming like a bull, hitting like a madman, and then just runs totally out of energy. Exactly. Um, you know, he was he had that one punch type of power. He was knocking dudes out. If he caught you, he could hurt you. But again, that started showing his limitations. Soon after that fight, he fought Jimmy Young. Jimmy Young at that point in the early 80s, after he lost to Jerry Cooney, Young went on a kind of, a, kind of a, you know, Indian summer, basically. Like, he had a really good run going on for himself that I think he won the uh, comeback of the year for Ring Magazine for the string of wins that he had. And um, Jeff Sims was one of the casualties during Young's run. And that's not to say that, like, you know, that's like a bad loss. Jimmy Young, first off, survived George Foreman. After getting knocked out by Ernie Shavers, he survived him in a rematch. Young had fought the best of the best from the 70s of that whole era. Like, you know, and Sims, him being very limited as a boxer or, you know, kind of rudimentary besides his big power, wasn't going to beat a guy like Jimmy Young if he was on his game. So that's not a bad loss. But the one that another fight, again, that we just, this, uh, you mentioned, Pat, slightly earlier, segued into this one was right after the Young fight, he fights Ernie Shavers on the undercard of the Ali um, Trevor Burbick fight in the Bahamas. Yeah, another another connection with Burbick. Somehow these guys just wind up crossing paths one way or another, right? Man, you know, man, dark energy, bro. They all just kind of find each other at one point. Well, and, and you know what, dude? And you know what, also, I think that there's, like, the, the common thread here is also Muhammad Ali. Because, I mean, yes. you know, Muhammad Ali was just the gravitational force from the mid 1960s and possibly earlier all the way into the early 1980s somebody trying to land a a going away fight with muhammad ali still you know Everybody jeff sims for the ali fight <laughs> Every, yeah. i mean you know like we discussed in the last show before before burbick was discussed as was finalized as ali opponent everybody assumed in the division was rumored to fight ali at one point Totally. You know, that was a big money maker. So, yeah. And the fight with Ernie Shavers, I mean, it's on YouTube. So I highly recommend if you've never seen that, if you'll listen to this show, you probably have. But if you never have, it highly recommend it. The fight was awesome. But the crazy thing is, it almost didn't come off because that whole promotion was such an absolute shit show fiasco that at the very last moment, because the card was messed up, the timing was messed up, the producers had no idea what they were doing, no one knew what they were doing, when Shavers and Sims were getting ready to finally walk into the ring, they tried to stop them and say, hey, this fight can't go on, we don't have any more time, we gotta go with the main event. And Shavers' his manager basically said, fuck you, get out of our way, we're fighting now. And they proceeded to go on with the fight. So, as the fight starts now, think about this. You got two of the hardest hitters the past 50 years in the heavyweight in the heavyweight division going at it. Absolute one punch knockout artists, you know, fighting each other. You know this fight's not going to go to distance. And it almost ended in the first round because Shavers was um according to Shavers, he liked to take a nap, you know, for a while before his fights, as some fighters like to do, and then he warms up and then gets into the ring. Because everything was such a fiasco, when Shavers was napping, thinking the fight was going to go on at a certain time, he was suddenly jolted awake and told, hey, you're going on next before he even knew what was happening. Shavers was only, you know, already in the tail end of his career at this point as being a fringe contender, recognizable name, whatever you want to call it. And that definitely affected him. He never had a chance to warm up, and he goes into the ring completely cold against a monster like Sims. So the round proceeds, and then Sims drops a one-two on him that absolutely knocks Shavers into another realm. And from there, the referee gave a super long count, definitely to, you know, to Shaver's benefit for that point to recover. And if you, according to various reports, people, internet, whatever I've read, some people have said that in the clinch at that point, Shaver's kind of whispered to him, hey, man, relax, we got a long way to go or something like that. And that kind of messed with Sims. And then from there, the fight goes on. It was still back and forth until Shaver's eventually stopped him. What do you think about it? 
man, it's a, it's an incredible fight. It's one of those fights. Well, luckily it's being one of the few fights we have, or some of the little footage we have of Jeff, Jeff Sims, it's pretty good footage. You know, it's, it's really entertaining and it's a good, uh, it's a good example of who he was as a fighter and as a puncher. Um, I mean, Ernie Shavers, obviously going in against Ernie Shavers at all, any footage of Ernie Shavers, people should be going out of their way to go look for just because of the, if you're not familiar with the fight, the possibility of him delivering something at any moment is just like, it's pure tension. But um, in, in Ernie, Shaver, in Ernie Shaver's fights from the early, early 80s are always fun to watch. Because even if he doesn't win all of them, the majority that he fought at that point, he would end up losing. But they're always fun because at some point he knocked the hell out of the guy he was fighting. Whether it was Tex Cobb, who didn't go down, but got his head sl- you know, rocked in different directions while George Benton almost had a heart attack ringside. Or, you know, we mentioned Bernardo Mercado getting dropped really hard. Um, Jeff Sims getting knocked out. Um, Quick Tillis getting knocked flat on his face. Like, Shaver still had that power that made him exciting, even though he wasn't coming up short in these fights. And, you know, when Jeff Sims actually fought uh, Jimmy Young, so what happened was <clears throat> Jeff Sims was scheduled to fight Scott Ledoux. And Scott Ledoux, oh, wow. yeah. You know, he probably would have knocked out Ledoux, I think. What do you think? I mean, dude, Scott I don't Ledoux know. Maybe was... not, actually. That would have been a tough fight. Well, Ledoux, Scott Ledoux is pretty was... limited. And he was the kind of fighter who's probably going to, like, sit there and take some punishment. But, like, mm-hmm. if, if he could get through it, though. You know what I mean? Like, if he could get through the first handful of rounds. But that was the problem. That was the problem with Jeff Sims, too. Is if you could last the first handful of rounds, like, you're going to be all right. And you'd probably... Yeah probably wear him at wear him out you know but like uh he was supposed to fight scott ledoux and scott ledoux winds up i think getting sick or injured i can't remember but one of the other and he pulls out and so jimmy young it winds up being brought in jimmy Lung, young's obviously <laughs> you know thought of as washed or in the tail end of his career or whatever a fairly safe opponent for the people handling jeff sims and they were obviously wrong because Jimmy Young winds up holding his own. But it sounded like the crowd, at least reading the reports, the crowd was not super happy with the decision and thought Sims deserved to win. But that uh, he commanded the first four or five rounds, but then got lazy in the middle and then closed strong. So I don't know. I've never seen it, so I couldn't say. I don't know so, if there's any footage of it. Yeah. But like you said, even so, a pretty understandable loss because Jimmy Young's not some slouch. He's a pretty tricky fighter, and especially for a younger guy who's bound to kind of peter out or uh, exhaust himself punching, you know, a, a good puncher doing Probably going to leave for a guy like Jimmy Young at that point. Absolutely. A lot of fighters are, yeah. A lot of more inexperienced guys are, but before we get into the real juicy stuff, I wanted to take a quick pause and, you know, for sponsor consideration. Yes, sir. <laughs> so support for Knuckles and Gloves is brought to you by Manscaped, the men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world. Manscaped offers precision engineering tools for your most sensitive parts. And speaking of which... Manscaped just launched their fourth generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. So join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code GLOVE, that's G L O V E, at manscaped.com. So as for the Lawnmower 4.0, don't worry about the previous models. You can easily remember the Lawnmower 4.0 by remembering four things. So number one, the Lawnmower 4.0 it has an on-off switch that can trigger a travel lock so it doesn't turn on by itself. It comes with a very cool little case. Number two, the Lawnmower 4.0 has a 4,000K LED light to help guide your way as you trim your nether regions. Number three, the Lawnmower 4.0 has a custom guard length so you can trim as short or long as you like, I suppose. And number four, the Lawnmower 4.0 has a wireless charging system that works through electromagnetic induction for all you cool science people out there, which can help the battery last longer. So get 20% off and free shipping with the code GLOVE at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free worldwide shipping at manscaped.com by using the code GLOVE. So unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job. 
with Manscaped. Trust me, we want to be Manscaped. It's like I I slid so aerodynamically right into my chair today. (laughs) True story. Those oils that they sent are God-given, God-sent. Yeah, dude, they got some real nice smelling, like perfumey oils. They're, it's, I'm not going to lie, dude, like you're, a lot of people are skeptical and I don't want to go on too long with the ball talk. I know, I know it's kind of uncomfortable, but dude, it's, I'm just saying. You want your balls to feel good. Trust us when we tell you, you want to go that route. I'm not even bullshitting. (laughs) Whoever wherever you're going, you know what I'm saying? Your significant other will thank you. Will appreciate you. Yes. Mine certainly does. So speaking of Jeff Sims here, going right back to the heavyweight, the true, the true crime stuff. So this is kind of where the story starts getting a little more off the rails. It's already been off the rails. I mean, it, it kind of got back yeah. on the rails for Jeff Sims. He, he seems like he's on the the correct path despite losing to Jimmy Young he winds up uh losing to Ernie Shavers but then he corrects himself and starts racking up a few wins he defeats Floyd Jumbo Cummings uh you know a, a nasty couple guys knockout. A, nasty, a bunch. nasty knockout <laughs> he kind of like these guys that are like uh have one or two losses not super experienced, but have about the same amount of experience as him. So he's taking on fighters that I think uh, they his management obviously had, they got the message that putting him in too much was, you know, shooting too high was too much at this point and that he needed more experience and he seemed to be getting it. And actually, so <laughs> this is the next kind of chapter in the Jeff Sims insanity here in 1982. He was shot, and I think that you were actually the first person to tell me about this story. I, it was like a while ago, or you you said something about it. I'm almost positive, but Jeff Sims winds up getting shot in 1982 in September because he, he says he hears a noise in his apartment, and so he goes to look, goes to investigate like any good horror movie person would, and he sees someone that he says he recognized that's coming in through the fire escape. So <laughs> he said, according to him, that we got to talking, which obviously meant that they were scrapping, and that uh, he got shot in the shoulder and then got shot in the ass before he decided yep. to turn and run and jumped out a window. And according to him, landed on his feet from the third floor and hitched a ride to the hospital. <laughs> Yeah, is it true? Who knows? You know, I mean, he he definitely was shot because there are gaps in his career. If you go on box rec and look at it, you're going to see certain gaps here and there, and it's because, as he would call them, accidents, incidents. You know, I got hurt, my injuries, <laughs> and it's because he was getting shot. And you know, during that era, I'll give you an example. Um, Ronaldo Snipes, who a lot of people, you know, another contender from that era who lasted into the 90s and probably most known for dropping Larry Holmes en route to losing an entertaining fight for the title. Um, He was good friends with Jeff Sims, one of the few fighters who was close to a guy like Sims, right? And Ronaldo Snipes actually told me, he was like, Jeff, I'm your friend. He was like, I can't be hanged with you, man. He basically told him, I can't hang with you. Every time we hang out, you get shot at or something. Like, I'm cool. Well, when when he wound up getting shot in 1982... In the newspaper, I'm looking at it right now, the newspaper article, the title of the newspaper article is Boxer Sims Can't Dodge Those Bullets, which is true. And then next to his photo, right under his photo, it says Jeff Sims was shot again this summer. Like just plain as day, like, ah, he's shot again this summer. Because he was getting the instance. And Sims was that type of person. He had a very, very small temperament, you know, um... I've been on a few message boards trying to do research on them because, again, there wasn't a lot on the internet. You're 10 times better than I am when it comes to finding these amazing articles and all that stuff. But um, in a few of these message boards, there was a few people that commented that knew Sims personally. And they all said, dude, like, he could be a nice guy, like you mentioned, you know, a charming individual, but would then just snap, whatever. He could completely go 360 and just be wilding out. 
and just go crazy and do, you know, and become violent. And at that point, who's going to be able to beat him in a fight? Like a guy like him who's grown up fighting his whole life. He's big. He's muscular. Like you said, he's a professional fighter who knocks the shit out of everybody that he fights, basically. You're not going to beat him in a fist fight. You know, there's always some kind of incident. Most people were packing back then. They just end up shooting him or stabbing him or something. So he, he, he fell in trouble because of, you know, it's the way it was. It was a temperament. He just kind of attracted that type of stuff. He went from uh, obviously a, a much busier schedule in 1982 he, when he winds up getting shot. He only fights, I think, three times or something in 1983. And his activity, his activity noticeably drops off from there. And I think that it was just the trouble that he wound up uh, frequently getting into the local papers and the people guiding his fight career pretty much plainly said that he was getting into too much trouble and that the local local law enforcement knew who he was because he would just he he well when you're known by known by any local law enforcement that's not good unless you live in a, a tiny town of like 200 people and the sheriff just knows who the fuck you are because that's you know where you live but when you're living in a fairly large Florida city and the local law enforcement knows you, it's usually bad news. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, so his career did better. I will say this, because he was under the Don King umbrella, remember how King was using all those heavyweights basically as little chess pieces to pick and choose wherever he wanted because he didn't care. He owned them all. Um, Sims, yeah, Sims was actually considered uh, when Harry Kotsia knocked out Michael Dokes for the title, for the WBA title, Sims was actually considered, Don King had placed him up to be a potential first first opponent for Kotsi, um in South Africa as a de title defense. And I can see it now, too, because he probably figured Sims would be the type of guy that wasn't going to protest or think anything about apartheid or any of that type of shit. would just go with it. So that's why he thought, it, and it would probably thought it would be easy pickings, too, for, Co for Kotsia to win, you know, first defense. But obviously that didn't happen. Greg Page got the shot. But as the gaps because of what was going on with him getting shot, all these other things, he did have two very notable fights. And this is probably the apex of his career when it ended at this point as, as any type of, you know, name. And the first one was against an up-and-coming Tyrell Biggs fresh out of the Olympics. And that fight happened in 1986. And what makes that fight so notable is that um, Biggs won the fight, but it was a really tough fight. But Sims as we talked about his punching power, actually broke um, Biggs' collarbone the early in the fight with one punch, reminiscent of a guy like Florentino Fernandez breaking Gene Fulmer's punch with a, you know, elbow with a, with a left hook. Like, that's freakish power, Pat. Yeah, that's pretty serious stuff, dude. I mean, it's like, it's not that, physiologically speaking, the collarbone is like kind of soft, kind of pliable. I, I mean, I could see it breaking, I've kind of injured I mean, mine. Still being able to punch a dude just hard enough to crack it. But and yeah, but there's yeah. a difference between like you're doing some shit, you injure your collarbone, and somebody just like punches you and breaks your collarbone. That's pretty scary. I mean, and again, Jeff Sims is 6'3". You know, he's usually going about 2'10", 2'15", when he's in good shape. And I don't know that he's ever really in not good shape. I'd have to look through to like check some weights. Okay, I see 2'22". Probably didn't look like fantastic at 222 maybe i don't know he probably did actually it's a lie but no, you know he's he was coming in in a like you know a fairly similar to like a muhammad ali in terms of stature 6 3 210 just good shape always in great shape and excuse me from there he if you watch before the fight too there's a full broadcast on on youtube and you'll see a quick Sims interview where you can kind of get a sense of who he was. And you can tell he's out there with um, how he's describing Big saying, you know, oh, yeah, he won the Olympics. But, you know, the Cubans weren't there. The Russians weren't there. So I don't really know how tough it is. I'm sure enough I'm going to go in there and test him. And his eyes just look like scary, bro. They're like twisting around. And you're just kind of like, I wouldn't want to fight a guy like that. Absolutely not. If I, was, if I saw him being interviewed and I knew I had to fight him, I'm taking the next plane out. I'm out. I'm not fighting again. <laughs> It's just, I know my limits, and I know a guy like that's going to, you know, stomp my head in. But they also showed the briefest clip of the Jumbo Cummings knockout. And again, I've never seen the full fight of it or whatever, but they, Cummings, another dude who has that same very muscle-bound body, you've seen him, um, kind of similar background, I guess, to, um, 
to Sims. And when Sims hits him with the right hand, the guy's body just turns into like 250, 40 something pounds, 20, whatever his way he was, a pancake batter, splatters all over the canvas. And Tyrell Biggs recently did an interview with Ring Magazine, you know, the best I face feature that they do. Yeah, and, totally. Uh, he was, they asked him, and he mentioned Sims was the strongest puncher he ever faced. He said over Tyson, over any of any other one that he fought, and he fought a who's who back then, Lewis, Bo, so on and so forth. And he said that whenever Sims hit him, everywhere he said it hurt, and he never felt pain like that. And he said he broke my collarbone. And he goes, honestly, if he had hit me in the, you know, in the chin hard enough, he probably would have stopped me in that fight. So. Damn. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's a gut check right there. And that's probably why Briggs um, was pushed so quickly into a Tyson fight was because of how he was able to pull through that one. So there is another gap, though, between there and 1989, when his next fight is against Jose Rabalta. And this is on the undercard of Mike Tyson against Carl the Truth Williams. But the, the backstory here, and this is how Jeff Sims, again, plays his small part in history, and actually big part in history, but he just how he did it. So, Rabalta had fought Tyson previously, as everybody knows, and got stopped, but he put up a credible enough performance that he was going to be used as the opponent for Mike Tyson's defense in Tokyo against, um, against Mike Tyson. And um, all he had to do was get through Jeff Sims, who had a three-year layoff from being shot and stabbed or whatever the hell happened to him this time. So, now that he's back, right? And instead, Sims you know, again, puts in one of those types of performances, even though he's limited, even though he's been off for three years, he still has that monstrous punch. And I've never seen footage and I'm dying to see it because people have described it as being one of the most ridiculous punches you've ever seen. Sims, I guess, in round six, hit Rebalta with such a right hand that on message boards, they've said that Rebalta's head almost did a 360, like exorcist type shit. Just spun around, like, hard. And then he went down in a heap. And he barely won the fight. He won the fight, but Rabalta struggled and barely won the fight. And because of that, and because of Sims and almost knocking him senseless in the aftermath of that fight, Rabalta was axed as Mike Tyson's opponent, and Buster Douglas was placed in as a replacement. And the rest is, you know, his history. Buster so Douglas, because <laughs> Buster Douglas had already lost. And he'd already kind of like had some some of that luster, whatever luster he had was already kind of like knocked off. And so oh, Buster wait. Douglas being the the backup opponent was like, eh, whatever, I guess. Yeah, we'll go to Tokyo. We'll make a big show of it. It's not going to be much of a thing. But it, it would have been Ribalta had he not been knocked silly by Jeff Sims in the sixth round of that fight where... Yep. They said it sent sweat flying and, you know, that kind of thing where just, boom, massive shot. I reached, you out, I, reached out to, yeah, I reached out to a few people, like major tape collectors, that asked if anyone had footage of it. And I don't, no one has it. I don't know. I, it had to have been filmed. It was 1989. Like, I'm sure that they, the Don King has some master film of it, some, you know, in his vault somewhere. Because exactly. maybe even if it wasn't, even if it wasn't, um, televised if Rabalta had scored a major knockout that would have been shown because they were like oh Rabalta did this you know he's gonna go on to fight Mike Tyson so anyways you know what's interesting too from that is that a year later when Greg Page was knocked out against Mark Wills on the undercard of um, Perno Whitaker um, Azuma Nelson I think you hear Larry Merchant say afterwards that's the Jose Rabalta syndrome and I didn't know what he meant by that until now, reading, you know, after Mar um, Jeff Sims knocked the shit out of Rebalta, you know, that it makes all sense now. Hey, you just lost a title fight because of this. It's, it's, I mean, uh, the the amount of things that, like, Jeff Sims was kind of, like, tied into historically. It's crazy, right? <laughs> but, like, like, always a bridesmaid, never a bride type of thing, you know? Just one of those guys, he's always in that type of area, someplace. Like, he played a part in history right there. It's like Forrest Gump. He, he was like Forrest head. Gump. Yes. Yes. He's Forrest Gump. <laughs> Except <laughs> a lot crazier like in, in, in the bad, bad Forrest Gump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's the heavyweight Forrest Gump, dude. He's, hey, he got shot crazy. in the ass, too, just like Forrest. D damn, that's actually another parallel. Holy shit. D dude, did Zemeckis <laughs> steal Forrest Gump's story? That's some bullshit. Got shot the same year. Shame, damn. No, so uh, 
getting kind of like going forward with his career because he doesn't have much career left. He winds up fighting Trevor Burbick in Canada when Trevor Burbick is 36 or 37 years old. We just talked about Trevor Burbick, you know, and I think that that's probably one of the reasons why we got Jeff Sims on the brain because they, they cross paths and they cross paths before and they both had a just, you know, wild existence and unfortunately a violent end but uh trevor burbick winds up defeating him in six rounds and trevor burbick's also kind of coming back you know on the comeback trail and says that he winds up talking a bunch of trash afterwards and saying oh this guy's a heavy hitter but he couldn't do nothing with me i was slipping and sliding all over the place he couldn't do anything you know talking a bunch of crazy stuff it was trevor burbick you know we just if you haven't listened to that show you need to go back and listen to it um but, you know, he gets in with Phil Jackson, who's undefeated at that time, an undefeated Phil Jackson. So, I mean, you know, obviously at this point, I think it's clear that Jeff Sims is being used as fodder for a lot of these other fighters who are kind of either coming up or coming back in a couple of... And, uh, and it's true. It's true, too. By, by that point, he was at least a decade past his peak. Whatever his he, peak he physically been. looked different, too. You yes. could see, like, physically, he didn't even look like the same guy. I mean, you know, he had a lot of hard living, and the fact that he had to take three years off from his last, from that till fighting Rabalta because of his, excuse me, going through what he went through, you know, being shot, stabbed, other instances, getting arrested countless times, all kinds of stuff, like, he was worn out. He lived the life of five people at that point, and the fact that he was still alive was actually pretty remarkable, I would say. Well, and you, one of the things you said earlier is that the idea that he'd even make it to 18 was pretty outlandish considering all the stuff that he'd gotten into. And I mean, and just his background, it's not people, you know, people he's living on borrowed time. It's not, it's, yeah. You know, when you make it, you really, that's like a big accomplishment and people, you know, it's commendable to be able to do that because it's, it's easy to fall off the tracks and just kind of go with, you know, what you spoke, what everyone expects you to. I'm not going to falsely claim that I come from a hard world or anything like that, but I'm smart enough to understand it and know enough to, to say that that's being able to make it coming from that world is not easy. And he almost did. He came really close in a number of instances, but he wound up, unfortunately, just like not only becoming uh, gr ground up by life, but ground up also by boxing ground up who knows done what was done to his brain that was already kind of in a funky place most likely so uh he, he uh, lo loses to james bone crusher smith in his final fight in uh sorry 1991 and where his story winds up coming to an end and what's unfortunate about it apart from being tragic is that it's really abrupt and that there's not that much information about it. Like, I wish I, I wish I would have been able to kind of like track down a whole bunch of stuff. I told you, but it's, it's scarce. It's, it's very scarce. So I'll go ahead and just read what's there just because why not? Uh, there was an article in November of 1993 and it says, Jeff Sims shot to death on Miami street corner. And as I just said, he was kind of living on bar borrowed time. If he were a cat, you know, he's like used up eight lives or whatever. It says, Jeff Sims, a hard-hitting heavyweight you learned to box in prison while serving a manslaughter sentence, was shot and killed on Miami street corner this week during an argument. He was 39. Several times during his career, Sims appeared to be on the verge of slugging his way into boxing's upper echelon. He made headlines in 1980 when he split Muhammad Ali's lip during a sparring match at the old 5th Street Gym in Miami Beach. He was a sparring partner for Jerry Cooney in his prime, which is true, actually. I'll interject and say that he was sent uh, to spar with Jerry Cooney not long after getting out of prison and getting and hooking up with uh, the Dundees. I guess he was sent to spar with Jerry Cooney. I should have asked Jerry. And uh, he apparently had a great time, according to him. I don't know. I guess he'd love, he'd love to get hit. I don't know. But in any case, uh, back to the article, Sims made his name with hard hitting jabs. He launched his career in the late 1970s with 11 straight knockouts, 10 of them in the first two rounds. He once broke an opponent's collar pone. His one punch, his one punch power brought him several times to the threshold of national attention. 
but critics said he came to depend too much on his strong arms and didn't train well enough. At about 9 p.m. Tuesday, Sims was shot in the abdomen during an argument with an employee of a Liberty City store in the area of Northwest 18th Avenue and 65th Street. He died at Jackson Memorial Hospital. Metro Dade detectives have questioned the man who shot Sims, but have not brought charges, said Detective Luis Estopin Estopinan. Uh, the bullet that killed Sims was the sixth one he took in his life, which began and ended with violence. As a boy growing up in Belle Glade, Sims had a reputation as a street tough. He was stabbed once and was known to local police for various minor infractions of the law. When Sims was 16, he killed a man in a gunfight over money, but not before he was shot twice. He was convicted of manslaughter and spent seven years in prison before being paroled. He took up boxing while in prison and continued training at the 5th Street Gym after his release. Um, let's see. After making a name for himself with early round knockouts, his lax training caught up with him and he began to lose to more fit players. He quit the game and drove a taxi in Miami Beach. He faced another round of gunfire when a man surprised Sims in his apartment and shot him three times before Sims could jump out a window. In the late 1980s, Sims tried a comeback. He was still boxing as recently as 1990, but was losing. He scored more than 20 knockouts in his career. Um... Ray Hunter, owner of The Market at 6514 Northwest 18th Avenue, where Sims collapsed after being shot, said Sims lived in the area and was a regular customer. He was a good guy, Hunter said. Estopinan wouldn't say what caused the argument that took Sims' life. He said the facts he's presented, the, the facts will be presented to the state attorney's office. And so that's it that's pretty much the end of his story because the state attorney's office, as far as I could tell, did not decide to bring charges against the fellow who shot him. So I couldn't find anything else. If uh, there's, I suppose could be uh, more local or defunct newspapers that have more information, but if they're around, I, I didn't see them. So I have Most no idea what the conclusion that was. I'm, I'm not going to lie. That was probably the most in-depth um, article I've heard on his death because I can't find anything else on it. I've literally, there's nothing on his death out there, like really, or just in general on a lot of stuff. Like there's, there's not a lot, you know, there's no footage. There's not many footage of his fights. If you want to look, you have the Shavers fight, the um, Tyrell Biggs fight, and I guess his last fight against Bone Crusher Smith. Those are the three that you can find online. Um, even photos are kind of scarce, like I mentioned earlier. But, you know, kudos to you, man, because that was more than I ever knew about his passing. Yeah, it's, well, there's just not more, more there. I wish I, I wish I had more. And I, maybe there is more. Maybe, maybe there was more in uh, the police reports or whatever, but they, they just never released them. I have absolutely no idea. But that's... That's pretty much it. But I mean, it's a tragic end, but again, it's an end that people are not really surprised that it happened that way, too. No. No. And I mean, kind of like I said earlier, when he had gotten shot uh, another time, the newspaper said he got shot. So matter of factly, because that's, I mean, it, it was just, I guess, kind of not surprising to anybody because he was always getting in so much trouble despite being a good guy or a nice guy. Like I said earlier, you can i think be both you know you can be a good guy or a nice guy have good intentions but just get into trouble and i think that that's exactly the that little space where jeff sims existed absolutely in, in that case he fit right in with the 80s era in that heavyweight division <laughs> you know wound up getting one final piece of muhammad ali you know like one to say the least, man, that's, you know, there's claim to fame. Jeff Sims does play. It's it's funny, like you mentioned, the Forrest Gump thing, because, like, for a guy who obviously never really reached his potential, he was close a couple of times, but never really reached what he could have had had he lived a good life and never gotten into trouble and shot or whatever it may be. He still holds his place in history for various things. The Ali incident and why he grew the mustache and the whole James Buster Douglas becoming challenger to Mike Tyson. That was Jeff Sims that ended up making that happen, you know? Like, well, the Ali thing followed him for a number of years. So oh, yeah. to the point where I think that he got kind of annoyed by it because 
he had told the story a handful of times and I think you, you went over it pretty good, but you know, he, he said stuff like Ali was talking trash to him. And so, uh, according to other people in the gym, I think it was one of the Dundees said that Ali took out his mouth guard to talk shit. Yes. And that when he did that, Jeff Sims went boop and hit him with a left hook. And right when he hit him with a left hook, they could see that his lip was split. And they said, don't worry, it's, it wasn't split all the way through, but he, he obviously required several sutures, several stitches. So it was bad enough that it was, you know, it, it delayed stuff. And it he wound up, I guess, I don't know if, what John Tate would have pulled at, at that point, if anything. But John Tate wound up getting handled by Mike Weaver and just, yeah, a lot of these kinds of little micro incidents wind up determining a lot of historical stuff, which is crazy, especially in Jeff Simpson's case where I, I said earlier, always a bridesmaid, never a bride. Just like he was, he came very close. And he said uh, one time a, about the Ali incident, he said, you know, a lot of people know me about that. A lot of people uh, know I kind of got famous for busting Ali's lip. And he even said, technically, i am like, you know, uh, I made my, my way into history doing that. You know, I'm part of history. And he said, but I'd rather be part of history for the doing stuff the rest of my career, not just being part of history for busting his lip. So that's kind of, I guess, another sad thing is that he definitely winds up being more part of history because he busted his lip. And so when I actually looked to one final point on that, was that I looked and over on my bookshelf over here, I have that copy of Muhammad Ali. I think it's his life and times, the Thomas mm -hmm. Hauser book. And I mean, it, it's good. Don't get me wrong. It's definitely very complimentary to Ali, but it's good because it's very detailed. Despite being very detailed, it only mentions Jeff Sims really in passing. So again, just kind of going back, like I've said toward the end of all of these true crime episodes, uh, well, almost all of them, especially Charles Newell, James Hughes, not as much Trevor Burbick, but the the lesser known people. Uh, it's important, at least to me, and I'm pretty sure to you too, just to remember these people, to make sure that their stories are out there and that they're not just some footnote in a Muhammad Ali book. Absolutely, bro. They these guys they have their own stories, and like we just discussed for the past hour and a half, man, they're fascinating stories. They play their part in history. They play their part in the era that they were in, and they made for exciting memories. And the fact that as time goes on, they just kind of get forgotten about because it's easy to forget about people. As you know, you just remember certain names from certain eras, and everyone else just kind of gets swept under the rug. These guys had stories too. And they had very interesting stories and you want, and it's up to us and others to really put them out there and make sure that they're remembered. You know, you can keep them as you want and think about them how you want from that, but make your own assumptions, but at least their name is still out there. Jeff Sims played an integral part in the early 80s and mid 80s of boxing, even though he was never a top contender, even though he was never a champion, even though he had gaps because of his outside activities, but he still played his part and he still played an integral part in history and how things turned out in a couple of ways. So in that regard, he still should be remembered. And his story is crazy enough too, that you could honestly like make a, an episode on a true, on a, on one of those ID discovery shows or something like that, just talking about him, like a very, very fascinating individual as a right. lot of those guys from that ever were, you know, it's not just him. Michael Dokes has a crazy story. Um, you know, all oh, James Broad has a wild story. Tim Witherspoon and his dealings with Don King are just a crime thing in its own self. Like, all these guys have crazy stories. All these guys have very interesting stories where they came from, everything like that. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are out there, you know, that are into this type of shit and really want to delve into it. And I'm glad that, you know, we can put it out there for them. I agree, man. And I think that there, there are going to be a lot of people, hey, and I was even thinking while you were saying that, if Jeff Sims had nine siblings, who knows, man, perhaps one of the, one or more of the siblings are still alive and would like to hear more about his story or just to even know that he's remembered I mean, or his nieces, Sims wouldn't nephews, be that whatever. Old today. Yeah, Sims wouldn't be that old today where he wouldn't still be around. Obviously he was from only from the seventies and eighties. He'd definitely still be kicking. So you would assume that most of his siblings, hopefully would still be around as well. Well, you know, hopefully, 
hopefully in doing shows like these, we are doing, um, you know, some job in remembering these characters and these people and making sure that we're uh, passing along, that we're recognizing they're human beings who are products largely of their environments and stuff like that. And yeah. not just bad, bad people who met a bad end or anything. There's a lot of moving parts here and stuff, you know? Absolutely. You couldn't have said it better. Well, hey, I, I appreciate you doing another true crime show with me. I know it's not always like the, the most uplifting of subjects, but it's, it's still fun to, to remember the information and kind of like, you know, just talk history no, with somebody. I mean, so I appreciate it. Most definitely. And like we mentioned too, it, it brings back a lot of stories and stuff that either you forgot about, or if you never forgot about and never heard of it, then it brings you something new that you are the, you know, that you can look into and that keeps their memory alive. And because of that. Yeah. We're, we're still kind of buzzing from the Fury Wilder three business. And I mean, you kind of like look toward the weekend and it's like, eh, and eh, nothing looks as good when it's like, you're just coming off a big, it's like that sugar oh, high. Yeah, exactly, man. Most people are going to be watching the replay of Fury Wilder. If they're going to, if they're going to show it as they a, should be, out. as they Instead should be. Yeah, fight some guy that no one's ever heard of. So, yeah. Yeah, I had, you know, Mikey Garcia is obviously a very good fighter, but, you know, just, I guess, kind of put it out there. That's why we didn't do a preview because it's not just not worthy of doing a preview. And we would have rather done a, a true crime show like we did. So, in any Jeff case, deserve to be remembered over this fight. Trust me. I would say so. Yeah. And I, I appreciate anybody who listened into the show because that's just yet another kind of ear and person who's taking this in and helping remember these people and until we do another true crime or otherwise show if you are on social media you can follow us there like for instance if you are on twitter follow my buddy Aris pina at punch zone Aris. follow me patrick connor patrick m connor also you, you can subscribe on youtube or you can subscribe on the various podcast apps. And if you want to leave comments, leave reviews, those are always appreciated. We're also on Facebook and Instagram. You can find us on those places and also individually. So yeah, that's about it. Eris, dude, we'll talk soon. Appreciate it, bro. Ah, oh, man, this one's been a blast. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. For sure. Take it easy, everybody. Yeah.